Good morning, and thank you for joining us today on day three of Tech Days. Um, my name is Christine Trujillo. I am the Dell Account Executive for the University of New Mexico, as well as several other universities in New Mexico. And today we will be having a panel discussion on cybersecurity, uh, campus cybersecurity, trends and challenges in university education. Let me see, there's a few other people joining here, so I'll continue to admit. Um, I'd like to introduce my co-host, Chris Wessels. He is uh, a former CIO from the University of San Diego, and now he is the Dell higher, uh, Senior Higher Education Strategist. Chris will take it from here, and we hope you enjoyed today's session. Thank you. Thanks, thanks so much, Christine. And um, first off, I want to thank the University of New Mexico and the Office of the CIO Dwayne Arudi and Elaine for allowing us to, to speak with you today. And um, just to take care of some housekeeping matters, we'll have about 40 minutes, 45 minutes of webinar and panel discussion. And then we'll have about five or 10 minutes of Q&A. So if you have any questions, please drop those in chat. And Christine will help us with um, answering those questions uh, towards the end of the session. One other thing I wanted to mention too is we have a very uh, special uh, colleague here, a sketch artist, Karina Branson from Cover Sketch, who will be doing some visual storytelling of, of this event. And Kar Karina will come on for the last five minutes or so and give us a visual uh, storytelling of the session. Um, so with no further ado, I'll get started. One of the key things that my slides are not working okay um yeah there we go okay so i wanted to make sure that we have an introduction of our, our panelists you know one of the key things that we wanted to bring to you today from Dell Technologies is a group of specialists who really understand IT security in the higher education space better than anyone else. Um, it's common knowledge that institutions are, are built on this culture of trust and open networks and so forth. And that, that sometimes is in um, conflict with the fact that we need really strong cybersecurity uh, practices and solutions on campuses. So um, really important that we find ways to help advance uh, our security. Um, we are here, honored to be here today with Jerry Javala, Endpoint Security Sales Director, in, in North America West and the APJ, as well as Jared Whitehurst, who is a data protection and cyber recovery specialist. And then we have Nate, Nate Dallimore, who is a security specialist from VMware. And so I'm gonna go ahead and kick it off with uh, risks, challenges. And so, you know, clearly the work of information security officers and IT leaders are filled with many different challenges. There's no question about that. So Jerry, what are you currently seeing as the biggest security threat threats facing higher education? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, so there are multiple and in kind of no kind of particular order, what we're seeing across um, universities um, is a category of of cybersecurity threats that span um, kind of from the endpoint all the way into the servers. Uh, probably the biggest challenge that we're seeing is in this category of user compromise, really um, manifests itself in phishing attacks. Um, and it's one that um, many of the, um, the threat actors are, are using through very simple techniques such as you know emails and um, you know in, in some cases you know even gathering information via kind of phone calls misrepresenting who they are those kinds of things. There are um, and we'll talk more about it uh, through the through the panel. But there are um, some simple techniques 
and tools for IT. Um, you know, Dell uses a few of those. Um, a simple one that's just a little add-in for Outlook that allows you to report anything suspicious to the IT organization so that they can do some uh, preliminary investigation before you infect yourself as well as other users and servers. Um, the other one which has gained incredible amount of uh, press uh, the last several months um, in some very, very visible attacks has been ransomware. And uh, it's one that, um, you know, has had significant impact, um, you know, across universities, shutting them down, certainly in some of the public domain, government agencies, um, private sector, you know, everything from pipelines to meatpacking industries to transportation um, in schools. And the, there's really sort of two areas that um, address uh, prevention in that, in that space. Um, one is just very regular tested backups. Um, and then the other one is just encrypting the data, uh, providing data encryption so that if sensitive data is lost or stolen, um, it's at least protected and useless to, to the attacker. And then um, kind of the other area that's, it's pretty big is data protection. Um, there are many, many technologies out there. There's a lot of best practices in terms of how to protect student and university data. Um, you know, we offer some of those. We'll talk a little bit about it later um, in the area of DLP, uh, data loss prevention technology. Um, for those that have been around for even as long as I have, or maybe half as long, they remember that DLP used to be incredibly complex to deploy and the policies and everything around DLP used to be very challenging. But uh, much of the technology has improved dramatically. The advent of artificial intelligence and many of the cybersecurity technologies today has made deployment policies and other things much easier. So those are some of the main areas. There's many others, and I'm sure we'll talk about some of those as we go through this panel. Yeah, um, um, we, we will definitely touch on many of those things and others as well. Jared, Nate, do you are you seeing some of the same challenges that Jerry mentioned, mentioned or are there other points you'd like to make? Yeah, I'll chime in here. So um, I agree with, with everything that Jerry said. Uh, particularly on the, the increase of ransomware um, as, as a threat. One thing I think for, for universities that we see a lot is kind of the, the increasing need for identity management because, um, you know, as a university is very decentralized with many, many different personas and identities that change over time. A student comes in um, and gets certain credentials, then that student becomes a teaching assistant or they become a graduate assistant. They go to graduate school, right? And, oh, and then eventually they leave. And I think a lot of times universities, at least our experience is that's difficult to manage. Um, and so you have thousands and thousands of potentially unprotected accounts out there that still have access to your environment to some degree. So I think identity is, is increasingly important um, in addition, obviously, to the, the ransomware and things that have been discussed. Our corner of the world, um, I work for VMware, um, particularly for the carbon black endpoint protection solutions. Um, and so what we see is sort of a confluence of all these things coming together um, on the non-malware side. So, you know, traditionally there's, there's malware that you can run scripts against, um, you know, run scans and you can identify, hey, this malware was detected, let's, let's remediate. But now it's non-malware attacks. It's, it's um, innocuous uh, PowerShell scripts that maybe invoke a Excel process that that's not malware per se, but it's, it's, uh, it's a threat and it's dangerous because it's in your environment and it can move east, west from there. So it's the non-malware. So I would say identity as well as you know, the sophisticated non-malware attacks. 
that are that are becoming more of a threat. Yeah, those are certainly a concern. And Jared, did you want to comment? Sure. I just, um, I guess, not just to emphasize and add on to what others are saying, but the the event, um, how often the event is happening, has increased by so much especially in higher education in the public sector um, over the last few years and and mostly aimed and targeted specifically at um, backup um, repositories and production backups um, because they know that this is a business the people that are that are doing this the criminals that are in there in your environment that are trying to do things they're trying to earn money and they're trying to run names. And so with that, um, they're specifically targeting backup and production backups and trying to put you in the worst position possible for recovery. Mm -hmm. So cyber time, cyber, cyber recovery time objective, cyber recovery point objective um, are so critical for us to plan out early uh, and get ahead of this. And so I would, I would say and emphasize just the increase of the phishing and the sophisticated socially engineered attacks um, means that we've got to get out ahead of it and make sure that we're looking at all points uh, to protect from the end all the way down to the middle of the data center. And that's that's so important that point you made, Jared. Um, the fact is, you know, that the criminals are in a business. Right? Accenture did a report recently estimating there's trillions of dollars over the next five years that are at stake from potential um, new threats and events that will be occurring. It's not some mom and pop operation anymore. It's truly, a, a, in many cases, state-sponsored efforts. Um, so I wanted to also just sort of take a step back and hear a little bit from the panelists about security frameworks. It seems to me that, you know, that's a good place to start if an institution hasn't implemented a framework, you know, what would you recommend that they might try to do? Get it out there. I don't mind trying to um, This is Nate again. Um, I think NIST is a great one. Um, it, it, it's sort of a fundamental. Um, we certainly follow the NIST, NIST framework. There's one um, to maybe investigate a little bit uh, called MITRE. It's specific to uh, attacks, attack types, classifications of attacks. It's M-I-T-R-E, MITRE attack framework. Um, that's another one. Um, just And again, these are good, um, I, I think, on their own, but also to create your own framework, right, using different elements of this. But those are two that I would mention. That's, that's really interesting, Nate, so they could leverage different pieces of, say, COVID or or Hecbat or something like that, and then with NIST and Brent and MITRE and bring those together and build their own. That's, that's a really interesting observation. Yeah. One, one thing I would kind of add to that um, that I've seen um, is that a lot of times thinking about uh, kind of a framework and an architecture seems like a daunting task. Most universities that we work with, with very few exceptions, don't have this huge staff to sit there and work on it. They're day-to-day -day operationally trying to fight fires. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the one thing I would encourage is to reach out to resources. I mean, Dell has some, there are some great companies out there that provide uh, managed security services in the area of um, architecture and design around frameworks. And it's something that um, we and others can help with in terms of kind of building the basics. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect, it's evolving. Um, there are areas, you know, as we've talked about where there are greater threats that are more eminent. And so oftentimes that's a great place to start. Um, but clearly all of these um, elements that make up the framework, whether it's identity management or protecting data, um, responding to threats, doing remediation, recovery, all those are, are important aspects. And, um, you know, certainly we can help you as a resource, but, you know, there are a lot of companies as well that provide services that do that. Um, and even if you have some expertise, it's always nice to have kind of eyeballs from the outside world kind of look and that have experience with other universities 
and uh, allow them to provide data around what else is going on in the world that could help you and what have others done, what are best practices, those kinds of things. And in fact, Jerry, that's like a perfect segue <laughs> onto the next uh, point that, that I wanted to stress in this is that, you know, managed security services and the services that Dell has on our teams and VMware and with our partners um, can provide absolutely elevate the uh, posture of an institution. So, you know, it, and I, I see many universities, especially smaller ones, community colleges, technical colleges, they may only have one or two people that are working on cybersecurity topics. And in fact, it may be part of someone else's job. You know, they just heap, heap the security thing onto a systems administrator's job and, um, and create you know, an environment that's a little bit challenging for that individual. So, um, you know, I'd just like to hear your thoughts about managed security services and, you know, anything related to penetration and vulnerability testing or audits or anything like that, if you think it's prudent for institutions to take advantage of those services. I'll start with you, Jared. I know you guys have a services team. Yes, absolutely. So when um, when you look back, going to the slide before, when we think of NIST and you have response, um, having a partner that has gone through before these type of events and can come on the scene with you, knowing last known good copy to recover from, to get you back up and running soon um, and get you back to your your stakeholders and your your customers are able to access the data. Um, it is it is one of those things that when you do see that you have encrypted servers to know that I have a last known good copy that I'm going to be able to lay out and recover and begin that remediation uh, with a a partner like Dell uh, that is going to come inside and do instant response and going to get you back up and running. Uh, and that the burden's not all on you, you and your IT team. Um, that being part of your response, when you look at the NIST framework and you already have that in your book as a plan to roll back out after an event, um, it's peace of mind. And there's nothing that can, um, can value, you, you can't quantify the value of peace of mind knowing that I'm gonna be able to restore with a trusted partner. Indeed, and um, whoops, just go back up. I wanted to also make sure that we, we cover um, penetration and vulnerability testing because, you know, in security audits. At USB, we contracted with SecureWorks and had quarterly um, testing done. And the peace of mind that I had as a CIO from having a third party come in and help do that testing gave me sort of the ammunition and not only that, sort of a the peace of mind that I can go to the president and the provost and the CFO of the institution and be able to share the data with them and say, okay, we found gaps here. We're making these adjustments and, and moving the institution forward. So I just wanted to make sure that we, you know, touch on that, that it is so important to get third party um, services available and make sure that that information um, can be leveraged with the institution and the board to allow you know, for this level of confidence. And no one's perfect, but it definitely helps. Um, what I would say too, um, you know, one of the things I wanted to touch on for sure, and, and we've already mentioned this early in the introductions, is ransomware threats data backup and recovery. Jared touched on it, but I'd like to have him take a little bit deeper dive on that and have the panelists comment on this. But, you know, the fact of the matter is um, 2020 turned out, according to Bitdefender, to be sort of the most prolific year for cybersecurity events. And in fact, there was an uptick of well over 300% increase in the volume of ransomware attacks you know, and clearly universities and K-12 districts are targets. Um, no one's immune to this. And, you know, I work, I work with a U.S. medical school on the West Coast here in the Bay Area in San Francisco. 
And, you know, unfortunately, and we did never recommend this, but the actually paid out $1.14 million to thieves in order to get data back that then couldn't verify was of any use. You know, it could have been corrupted and so forth. And this, this had, you know, patient data, in it, research data, really critical stuff. So Jared, what are some of the suggestions that you have and can recommend in terms of data protection and how it can help mitigate the impact of ransomware attacks? I think that um, most strategically, we have to rethink what backup or data protection is. Um, we have to raise the expectations of uh, the peace of mind that it can provide and the strategy behind it. Um, so mm -hmm. now in a world with machine learning and artificial intelligence, like you had just spoken of, uh, if we can create a, a copy of your data, it that works. So as the FBI recommends that it's never stored on the, it's never crossing the same network as your production environment. If we can never have it on that network and we can have it in a bunker or a vault and apply machine learning and artificial intelligence in it to look through context indexing of the entire um, backup environment and looking for the effects of ransomware, malware, encryption on the data and alerting you to that suspicious activity, what that provides a university or any public sector um, entity is the knowledge that they're going to, within 24 hours, be alerted to suspicious activity uh, when the .doc turns to an executable under the that result of ransomware, malware, deletion, corruption, and it's going to alert you to it and let you be able to go and recover. And so if you, if you no longer have to ask, how do we get our data back to now we just ask, where's the last known good copy? And I have machine learning and artificial intelligence and automation tools to tell me where that last known good copy is. Then when I have my incident response team and my partners come in to help me restore, I'm laying out to them the hardest work of the NIST framework, what recovery is. I'm telling them where the good data is and where they need to start recovery. And so I'm back up and running in 48 hours, 72 hours. Uh, when we start to look at governance and compliance of, I mean, to get back up and running in 72 hours was unheard of. Now with our robust R&D around machine learning and artificial intelligence, we can accomplish that. And so we've got to, again, rethink what data protection and backup can do. And we make sure that we have a copy that's able to uh, let us know last known good copy, what account credentials were compromised, where the attack was, what happened under the, under the covers so that we can go remediate. We're not getting our data back. We're just going back to our data that is secure and off the network so that we can start a quick recovery. Yeah, and I've heard that term used, air gapping, you know, with vaults. Um, and that's really what we're up to, correct, Jared? I mean, you're keeping a sort of a pristine copy of the most critical assets of the institution and placing them where they cannot be touched. And I, I if think- If I could be, if I could interrupt real quick, I want to be specific on that air gap word. I think a lot of people are saying it, but nobody's really being prescriptive about defining it. And so mm -hmm. some people are saying air gap is the cloud by nature of being online and in the cloud at all times, like it's one object store that can be deleted with one account credential. Um, people are saying air gap and it's, it's in production. Um, it's not physically stored off your production network. Um, so whether it's the cybersecurity um, agencies or the FBI or your insurance, when you hear the word air gap, never on your production network. Um, that, is, that is key for you to be able to secure that data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know, I know the financial industry and um, what is it, the Department of Treasury and Commerce and the Federal Reserve Bank created this, this nonprofit group called Shelter Harbor, right? And th that group established some standards for creating a vault solution for financial assets for the United States. That's my understanding. And, and Jared, correct me if I'm wrong, but as, as, as I understand it, Dell's solution for data backup and recovery is really one of the only ones or considered to be the premier one following the standards set by the Shelter Harbor Board. Is that correct? 
as briefly as I can say, um, we were the first and only um, to get certified in that financial industry. When they looked about the, the effects uh, and how crippling it would be to our economy nationally, uh, if our banks were to be uh, to, were to have some ransom event like this and we were to lose data, whether to encryption or data theft and loss, um, they began to very, very prescriptively define what air gap looked for in that banking industry. But now with Dell being able to take those same enterprise class technologies and do them on smaller form factors, it's now just not for our biggest banks and largest federal institutions. It's now for our higher education. Yeah, so it fits in well to a research enterprise, a university, a medical school, you name it. So that makes a lot of sense. I'd like to also touch on another area. We, you know, we, we mentioned this earlier, and Nate, you, you touched on it a little bit. Um, but, you know, with the shift to much more remote teaching and learning, sort of these hybrid environments, which higher ed finds themselves in, and that faculty and students and staff may be at home, they may be remote. Um, it sort of exposed some things where, you know, the network boundary, the traditional network boundary doesn't really exist anymore. And that, you know, traditional antivirus solutions simply weren't, aren't up to the task of protecting uh, those devices uh, from malware and other things. Um, you, you mentioned something earlier on, Nate, that I found really interesting, and it was sort of these um, non-malware, non uh, non-phishing um, attacks where they might, in fact, be sort of fileless in nature. You mentioned PowerShell shell scripts. So it sounds to me like, you know, the next generation antivirus and EDR solutions are leveraging um, technologies and AI to help identify and respond to those fileless attacks. Is that, is that correct? And maybe you can elaborate a little bit more. Sure. So that's exactly right. And you know, I go back in time a little bit when as a security professional, or as you said, Chris, a, a part-time sysadmin who has security responsibilities, it used to be um, that you had to run multiple agents on a machine if you wanted to accomplish um, antivirus, um, you know, uh, patching, you know, name, you name it. I, we were talking to one customer just the other day who, who has nine um, agents on their servers. And um, it, there is an opportunity to consolidate those today. Um, and, you know, again, I represent VMware Carbon Black, which is the next gen antivirus and, and EDR tool. Uh, but really, it gives you the opportunity to put one sensor on your machine to do next gen antivirus, as well as all of these EDR functions. And I'll talk about that just real briefly. Uh, but that didn't used to be the case, like I say. And, and a lot of people um, are still running multiple agents or old legacy antivirus that doesn't do anything for these fileless non-malware attacks. They're completely vulnerable to the next generation of attack. And not even to mention EDR, which EDR, if you're not familiar with it, detection and response, basically that's, hey, something happens, something got through, what are we gonna do now? How are we gonna do the detection? How are we gonna do the remediation? How are we gonna do lockdowns, quarantines, patching, updates? so that it doesn't happen again. Um, and again, there is an opportunity, not just from Carbon Black, but certainly from us. Uh, you can do it on a single agent. And what I would say too, I know we're gonna talk about it a little bit later about um, creating a plan. And I have some thoughts there too, I'll save, but there really is an opportunity. And by the way, um, the costs to do this on a single agent are much less as well. I think there's sort of a misconception that it's very, very expensive to do this next gen antivirus and EDR. And it's really not, it's, it's being sold really for the price point that you would pay historically for, for old legacy antivirus. So there are lots of opportunities to improve, uh, you know, security posture with, with just an agent upgrade, honestly. And I know that's sort of a, a selfish thing to say, but it's true. Yeah, and, and I guess one of the other special things about um, the Carbon Black solution is that you leverage a cloud database and big data and AI 
in order to identify uh, anomalies and events for, happening all over the world on a daily basis, which is, is unique. Can I speak to that just real quickly? I'm glad you yep. brought that up, Chris, because um, that's another big change that's happened in the last few years, and that is SaaS delivery of security endpoint protection. Um, there was a reluctance for a long time to, to do SaaS for, you know, there, for a lot of good reasons, right? But there are so many great benefits to a SaaS endpoint protection product like a Carbon Black. One, the constant updating, right? You're, you're, you're never out of date. Um, you're getting constant information. We have, um, you know, over a billion clients or not, uh, uh, I think it's a hundred million um, endpoints managed that are creating this, like you mentioned, AI, this machine learning database that then is pushed out to our clients immediately. So you're protected on a real-time basis through this cloud infrastructure and you don't have to manage servers and manage those, those patches and updates. It's just much more streamlined. And finally, the agent is much lighter weight on servers and endpoints than historically has been the case. There's lots of frustration about Hey, my my antivirus client is clogging my my endpoint, or it's you know killing my server performance. That's just not the case. The, the new clients are much lighter weight uh, and much more efficient. So yeah, yeah, that's excellent. And so I I also wanted to um, just touch on this really quickly because there's some things around cloud IoT and and other planning um, that. Um, we'd, I'd like to get to, and I, I want to make sure we have time for everything, but, you know, are there particular things, you know, that you would like to mention panelists as, you know, being key to protect, detect, and respond to threats? We've already touched on some of those, you know, data protection, cyber resiliency, having a modern endpoint solution, but are there other pieces of technology that and, and identity management, Nate, you mentioned. Jerry, are there other things that you would like to mention that we should probably have in place at any uh, college or university in the United States? Um, there's um, so much technology, <laughs> as yes. Nate mentioned, nearly, uh, we have, you know, not just one, but probably a lot of clients that have eight, nine, 10 different, um, you know, clients, agents on their PCs. Um, there are um, there are some kind of higher level ones. So we talked about carbon black as both kind of the prevention um, detection and response capabilities. Um, there's also things that are um, a little bit more um, higher level within kind of the, the hierarchy. And one of those that's gained a lot of momentum right now in universities and candidly in all of uh, education is this whole concept around secure web gateway. Mm -hmm. And it's a um, incredible technology um, and it's kind of a portion of one of our offerings that you can sort of deploy kind of on its own. And what it does is it allows a higher level of filtering uh, prior to it coming into the university's domain. Um, you can provide filter capabilities to say, I wanna filter out both in and out, um, specific types of domains, categories, things like that. But then beyond that, um, you know, you can also uh, provide some capabilities around what um, individual users are allowed to do. Um, the technology um, has some really nice features around being able to look at uh, what's happening with data, if it's moving in a way that's not consistent with the normal operations of the university. If you have individuals that are copying, you know, literally gigabytes of data off of servers, those kinds of things, um, you can provide some visibility and potentially um, stop those kinds of things. Um, there's um, a number of other kind of technologies as well. Um, one of the interesting things that, that we've done at, at Dell is, We've instituted a program of user education where, you know, across our, you know, 100,000 plus, you know, whatever it is now, probably higher than that, an employee base. Um, you know, everyone with a PC is, goes through this kind of online education 
around cybersecurity and threats. And uh, there's a little add-in um, that allows users to um, be able to detect suspicious kinds of emails from phishing attacks, things like that. It's mm -hmm. a super simple tool. Um, but the other thing that we do, um, which is kind of interesting, is we have uh, a resource that basically sends out periodic test emails to verify that people are following the rules. And then if, if they click on an email that's a, a test phishing attack, um, we notify them and help educate them and, and do things like that. So you can have all the technology in the world, um, but it's not going to stop people from doing stuff. And so a little bit of it as well as just educating users on what's acceptable, what's not, what are the rules and guidelines, and kind of helping them as well help defend kind of your data and, and uh, applications. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And, you know, the, the human error element exists anywhere, if it's Dell Technologies or if it's at the University of New Mexico, pe people have inadvertent mistakes that they might make. And, um, you know, I think later on, we have a little bit of a slide on raising awareness among users, but it, it's a critical piece of the security mix. And, you know, I just, I wanna make sure we don't miss anything here. Are there other things around detection, response, and um, detection that, that um, any of the panelists would like? Otherwise, um, I, I can move on, Nate. I'll mention one, um, yep. and this kind of goes to best practices in my mind, and that is, I like the idea of a SIM, uh, right? Basically a log aggregator of all of these different tools that we're talking about, antivirus and IPS and um, all, these other, all these other things generating logs and potential alerts. Um, I think SIMs can be, they can be overwhelming, um, but I think having a source of truth having a place that everyone can go uh, that's agreed to is, is really important. And I, and I would say this extends beyond a technology of a SIM, like a Splunk or something like that, right? Netscope. It, mm -hmm. it, a SIM can be a person, a SOC, um, a mm -hmm. security analyst, basically someone who is, who is aggregating all of these different information feeds and trying to make sense of it distill it, create reporting based on that, uh, creating dashboards for management and things like that. Um, I think that's really important and missing. So if it's not implementing a, a software SIM, maybe it's having someone, um, even like I say, even if a SOC is, is one person, even if it's half of a, an FTE that is, you are the source of truth, this is the source of truth, um, starting at any point, right, and growing it from there, I think is really important to, to yeah. just get started. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, you know, we uh, we did touch. I think Jerry, you did mention this, but I'd love to hear the other panelists' um, points on this. But you know, higher ed has made shifts, like any other organization, to uh, software as a service in many cases. They're leveraging public cloud solutions. And the reality is um, higher ed, like other organizations or institutions is operating in a hybrid cloud world, which in my mind means that there's data in many different places and it's in transit, it's in rest. It may be moving between SaaS solutions or cloud solutions. Um, you know, how do you deal with sort of securing that. I think Jerry mentioned uh, uh, secure web gateways. Um, how, what are your thoughts on that? I'll, I'll throw it out there to Jared and Nate. I think you need multiple copies of your data. Um, I think you need to always remember that the same data governance that you do in production and you classify data, you need to do that same work with what you do in the cloud. And you need to have multiple points of time copies. Uh, you need to consider dual regions if you're in the cloud, making sure that um, if you're in if you're in AWS, that maybe you have a backup copy that's in Azure. Um, mm -hmm. Again, the same questions that you would ask 
multiple points of copy, multiple regions, make sure that you have um, very secure credentials. Um, those are gonna be the same questions that you should ask in the cloud. If it yeah. is possible for you to be able to um, replicate with efficiencies, that's where, that's where the difficulty comes is replicating the data and moving the data once you're in the cloud, keeping that OPEX cost down, uh, use a very efficient software mover that would be able to replicate the cloud down to maybe a production vault of which you have complete control over. Um, and yeah. maybe that is what you say, like, I'm going to move for the data center, a lot of it to the cloud. But one thing I'm not going to sacrifice is having a copy of our data to recover and know that it's good might be need to be uh, might need to reside in your own data center. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, Jared. And I think too, um, you know, some of our partners, we have a really strong partner with Netscope, right? And I think they built their business on this concept of cloud access security broking. And the solution essentially will ensure that notifications and data is secure and encrypted in transit and at rest. And um, just so people know that Dell has a strong group of partners in the security space and Netscope is one of them. We, you know, we partner with Absolute, we partner with um, uh, Portanet with Palo Alto, the list goes on and on. So there's a mix of great solutions and partnerships we have that can help um, with some of these really challenging things. Um, you know, this is one point I wanted to hit on for the panelists too. You know, we've all heard John Rose in the last year or two talk about the rapid growth of data and compute that occur at the edge of networks. And of course, campuses are not immune to that. I mean, you're seeing new smart cameras, um, intelligence cameras and that are basically sensors coming onto campuses. There's many other sensors that campuses use, you know, in utility systems, building control systems, access control systems, things like that that might hit a, a, uh, a campus today. So, you know, given the fact that the edge and data at the edge is growing. What are, what are some steps a university might take to secure the edge in IoT? I'll toss it up to the panelists. Anyone want to volunteer? Nate? You know, I don't know if I have any particular insights on, on, on the topic, to be honest. OK. Um, but I guess in terms of the networking and software-defined networking, um, VM oh, offers uh, sorry, Chris. Solutions. I was going to say if if we broaden it out, you know, and and do say from a VMware perspective, right? There is the concept of software-defined software-defined everything, right? And it certainly right. security. And so if you look at it from that construct, absolutely you know, how um, network security interacts with endpoint security and all of these other IoT and all these other devices. To me, that is an argument, again, for aggregation of some mm -hmm. sort, either mm -hmm. either through SIM or whatever your, your particular console of truth is. Um, again, that to me is an, is an argument for some sort of aggregation so that you are not network security isn't happening over here, endpoint security over here. I mean, that's all even with the security team, even right. if you broaden it out and say networks doing this and all right aggregation, I think is important. Yeah, a single source of truth is is really what you're getting at. And I do, I do think too, I mean, in terms of VMware's promotion and, and sort of pressing the bounds of, of, you know, a zero trust model around cybersecurity, there's always micro segmentation of the network with NSX that can, that can help with some of those challenges of isolating those devices. Um, so that's always a, a, an important thing. I also, you know, we touched on this earlier, um, Jerry, you mentioned raising user awareness or elevating user awareness. And at Dell Technologies, we have an easy way to report what is a phishing email. Um, I think this is something all universities should be doing. There should be a user awareness training 
on an annual basis. And then also, you know, fishing simulation, uh, you know, campaigns against the community are not necessarily a bad thing. So um, it's, it's one of those things where an institution can invest in things like Fish Me or Know Before or one of the other solutions that's out there to really sort of raise the um, consciousness of, you know, fishing and malware across uh, institutions. So really quickly, I think I will go back to the panelists so we have enough time for some Q&A and, um, and also see the visual storytelling from Katrina. Um, tell us a little bit, you know, looking forward, what I'd love to hear from the panel is looking forward, you know, how can you, um, how can a university sort of continuously improve their cybersecurity uh, posture and program and risk management. The reason I ask that is because the bad guys aren't sitting still, right? They're gonna start leveraging all of the great technology that's out there in the world, things like AI and ML and so forth. What as panelists and cybersecurity experts, what would you, what can you offer for um, advice to an institution in, in their efforts to move forward? Um, yeah. Do a workshop quick and early. Um, start at the very top uh, with education, higher education often being siloed. Um, look at this from a top down perspective um, and, and standardize. And then next year, standardize again and never quit. Um, having the conversation around how can you, from the top down, look at pooling your resources, coming together, standardizing around a good practice to make yourself more resilient from a cyber attack. Um, this means that you're doing data governance often, um, that you're testing and you're auditing often, um, and you're just making sure that you have in place the checks and balances to be able to know that you have peace of mind recovery when the event does occur. Um, I'll, I'll kind of highlight um, or bounce off that in, so again, broken record aggregation, right? But um, another context of that is I like the idea in higher education of a security committee, right? It's an extension of a SOC or some point of, of aggregation, right? That's people aggregation where you are coming together. And I know committees have a bad name, uh, but in this case, I think it's really, really valuable that you do bring in um, the security teams from different groups or whoever it is that you, you deem important to be on that security committee. I think it's critical. Absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, and, and that's something you can start immediately. It doesn't need technology. It just needs, you know, someone to get into a room and start talking to each other about security posture. Yeah, that's really good advice, Nate, because bringing a lot of smart people together and minds together to find, find new solutions is absolutely a better way to go than, than working in silos like that. And Jerry, did you have anything you wanted to comment on in closing here yeah. before we flip to Q&A? Yeah, the couple things that I would kind of add to what's been said is that no organization is gonna have all the skills that they need to do everything they wanna do or budgets and other things like that. But I would say, look at outside experts to help fill skill gaps in very specific areas. You know, we talked about like things like SIM and consolidating data. If you have expertise there, great. If not, you know, there's a lot of good um, experts, um, you know, including at Dell, but other places as well that can help you with that. And, you know, I always tell all my customers, the one area you don't want to compromise on is training staff. Um, you know, just as the threat landscape is evolving, the technology is evolving, um, it's more sophisticated, it's getting more complex, and you have really good people, and training them kind of helps build loyalty, but also expertise that uh, makes everyone more productive. That, that's a really good point, because when, you know, I, I know when budgets get strapped in universities, many times what, what we'll do is you'll strip out things like professional development funding out of the operating budget for IT. And in fact, that can be detrimental over time. You know, if people can't stay current with their skills, uh, it's, it's ultimately gonna lead to some, some pretty bad things. So, um, 
Chris, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, with that, I'd like to move on to some Q&A. And um, I think we had some questions possibly come in through chat. And uh, Christine, can you can you help me out here and share some? Actually, I don't have any right now. But um, if there's any questions out there, don't be shy. Now's the time to ask them. While we have um, our our panel of experts here, well, no question is is a bad question. There's lots to learn here. Well, one, one thing I just want to reiterate what Jerry just mentioned in, in pro professional development. IT and the uni universities and colleges need to maintain investments in professional development funding because so many times I see institutions, you know, they get strapped in budgets and so forth. One of the areas that frequently get cut is that professional development. Area. So it's just something um, I think that's really important. Chris, Maybe you could also highlight in the theme of advancing your cybersecurity posture is even grants office and, and looking at the options that are out there fund, for funding. Um, so yeah. Chris, will you kind of walk through that a little bit? Yeah, so the Dell Grants Office is a free program. It's offered to higher ed institutions in K-12 and state and local governments. The Dell Grants Office is a, a wonderful opportunity for institutions to pinpoint areas where they, they need support. And essentially it's a free service. The, the Dell Grants Office team will do the research, find grants for universities and colleges to move forward on initiatives. And these could be anything from high performance computing on to improving their posture with cybersecurity. You know, it's a relatively simple process that the institution fills out a lightweight form and they would work with me and Christine to do that. And then um, <clears throat> the Dell Grants Office would go and pinpoint grants that are appropriate, foundations and, and uh, funding opportunities outside the federal government, the state government, you name it. And uh, it's a great way to move forward. You know, one other thing, Jared, you just sparked in my mind is that you know, with all of the federal stimulus funds that are out there, you know, there's three rounds of stimulus that have hit higher ed and there's, you know, trillions of dollars in, in everything that the federal government is providing to, to education and state and local governments. There are opportunities to leverage some of that funding to help with cybersecurity practices on campuses. I mean, in the end of the day, you know, with all of the remote teaching and learning that's gone on and the ability to deliver the curriculum and execute research, um, there's absolutely possibilities for universities to justify use of those funds to deliver the fundamental mission of higher education. So I just, you know, I want to encourage any universities on the call, including obviously the University of New Mexico, to keep those things in mind as they're thinking about um, the optimal use of those funds. And, um, you know, we can help with that as well. Um, we have a ton of information on the parameters for use of the funds. We have lobbyists that have been tracking these things all over the United States. And uh, we're happy to help with that as well. Um, so if there are no further questions, um, Christine, I think what I'll do is switch over to Karina and we can have a little visual storytelling. Does that sound good? Yeah, if you stop screen sharing, then I'll start, Chris. Awesome, okay. There you go. Thank you. So, I've been listening, and as we've been hearing from this great panel, I've been um, illustrating what they're talking about in real time in the last hour. So all of you know and are quite aware that there's tons of challenges that are ever evolving in the cybersecurity world, individually and through the university system. And so um, some of the things that we're seeing rise in are phishing, um, 
fileless attacks that are non-malware attacks, ransomware, anybody hear that the past few weeks? Um, and then managing identity as students move out of the university and what happens to that data. So um, maybe you feel like you're already too busy and stretched thin. Um, so Dell's got this fantastic network of experts as well as services and partners that can help uh, support that. If not with that program or um, service specifically, it sounds like they can help you find the perfect fit. So there's a range of tools um, and strategies like NIST and MITRE. Um, Carbon Black has a lot of uh, potential around um, AI, machine learning, um, and thinking about cloud, internet of things, and edge technology, which is also constantly evolving. So thinking creatively and tying in with these experts whose job it is to keep their finger on the pulse with this leading edge technology. Um, thinking proactively, getting ahead of threats, being creative and innovative. And again, if that feels like a lot, that's why it's easier to do together in partnership. Um, and then some last highlights from um, words of wisdom from the panel that um, uh, develop top-down practices that are systematic across the entire university, um, practice aggregation of data, and form potentially a security committee. So you've got a brain trust helping develop these practices. And again, who can be expected to know everything? So look for the uh, expertise and, um, and folks outside of your organization to help fill those knowledge gaps. And I loved um, what Chris said at the very beginning that um, university systems often really operate strongly in a sphere of trust, and it's important to, again, be proactive and have strong cybersecurity practices. So um, thank you so much for the opportunity to visualize this. UNM will be posting these um, probably to the website and sharing them out, um, and, and it's been a pleasure. Karina, I think this is awesome, by the way. This is really cool. Yeah, it's, it's, we're going to have to use you on some of our other yes. presentations. I think Absolutely. we have to talk to Dell about hiring you for, for, yeah. some of our, um, for some of our events as well. That was awesome. Thank you. I'm, I'm so glad that I paid you all to say that at the end there. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone, cover sketch. You want to sign her up for your, for your webinars. So with that, um, yep. I think we're, Christine, we're I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, so thanks, Chris, and, and thank you so much to Karina, of course, and thank you to our panelists, Jared, Nate, Jerry, and of course, thank you to Chris for just a great session on such a very, very important topic right now. I mean, we just can't get away from this, and uh, just there's just so many horror stories out there right now. I don't want for any one of my customers to have this situation you know, that get put in this kind of cyber attack situation. So, you know, we're really thankful that you were able to join us on this session and, and this will be recorded, this is recorded and will be updated onto the UNM Tech Days website. And so, you know, if there, you know someone that wasn't able to join, please ask them to go take a look at the video. Um, we've also put another session, similar session with some other um, high education CIOs on, on the site as well. Um, very similar kind of conversation. So that might be something to go take, take a look at later. But again, I'd like to really thank the University of New Mexico for allowing Dell Technologies and our partner VMware to participate in uh, Tech Days this year. Um, and we hope that you really got a lot out of the session. If there's anything that you would like some follow up on, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm here and I will engage our specialists. Thank you all very much and have a great day. Thank you everyone.